what's going to happen. I think I'm broadcasting, but so far, uh, let me see. Oh, I think, think I'm here on Facebook. That's a good thing. Let me go live on Facebook. Okay, and uh, let me make sure that I'm here on YouTube. Am I live on YouTube? Am I live? Am I live? Am I live? Yes, I'm live. Amazing. Uh, it works. When the technology works, it's great. When it doesn't work, eh, not so great. But you know what? That's part of this journey here. Uh, you have to kind of accept uh, the good and the bad. Uh, that's the way life is. And this week, uh, well, three deaths that I, I want to mention here. Yesterday, we lost Carl Reiner. Uh, Carl Reiner isn't a jazz musician, but he is someone who's very important to me. He was 98 years old. He was a comedian, uh, an actor, a director. Uh, he teamed up with Mel Brooks to do The 2,000-Year-Old Man. And when I was a kid, I watched Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks all the time on TV. They made me laugh, kind of were my comedy mentors. Certainly Mel Brooks went on to make some really, really funny movies. I had the uh, pleasure of spending a couple of hours with Mel Brooks on a train once coming back from Fire Island uh, to New York. That was a totally, totally amazing experience. Hello, Ghana is in the house, my friend Carl. Um, so Carl will be remembered as also the father of Rob Reiner, uh, who's also made some great films. Uh, yesterday, or the day before, we lost Johnny Mandel. Johnny Mandel uh, perhaps is not known to everyone by name, but you know the song that he wrote, The Shadow of Your Smile, and also uh, the great composition, Emily, that he did. Uh, it was from a film called The Americanization of Emily, written by the great Patty Chayefsky, who later wrote Network. That song, Emily, Bill Evans took that and turned it basically into a jazz standard. Uh, so Johnny Mandel, also in his 90s, left us. And the other one, the other person that left us is a personal one for me, uh, a man named Walter Feiger, who was a Holocaust survivor. For the past uh, year, year and a half, I've been working with uh, some Holocaust survivors on a project about anti-Semitism. And Walter Feiger was one of those survivors. He was 92. Walter was a man who suffered a lot in his lifetime. He made it to 92, but he paid his dues big time. And uh, really a remarkable man, a survivor. Uh, between uh, surviving in a concentration camp, losing a wife and a daughter to cancer. All kinds of things happened to this guy, but a survivor, a warrior, he kept on going. Certainly touched me. I'll never forget you, Walter Feiger. You know, in this life, we meet people that touch us, that mean something. And I'm very lucky in that I've been deeply involved in jazz since I was a kid. And uh, yeah, Paul Desmond's version of Emily also beautiful. So uh, I've met some incredible people, a lot of them musicians, and today I'm going to spotlight one of those people. His name is Mulgrew Miller. Uh, I've spent time with Mulgrew uh, in the audience, listening to him, interviewing him, having him come out to my house, hanging with him. So today we're going to uh, focus on the music of Mulgrew Miller, and we're going to watch excerpts from an interview I did with him in 2007 and uh, love to see what you guys have to say about the incredible Mulgrew Miller. <laughs> Thank you. 
Buster Williams on bass, Jimmy Cobb, the late Jimmy Cobb on drums, If I Were a Bell. Of course, I always associate that song, that composition with Miles, with uh, Red Garland on piano. Jimmy left us a couple weeks ago, about a month ago, the last survivor of the kind of blue sessions. I think he said that he made $68 for the session, never saw any royalties. Well, <laughs> the inequities of the music business, that's for sure. But Mulgrew Miller, front and center. Mulgrew's part of that same tradition of Jimmy Cobb and Miles Davis. Uh, I mean, he's from Greenwood, Mississippi, came to New York via Memphis, part of an incredible jazz scene down there. I first heard about Mulgrew, and a lot of people did it when we played with Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. We had Benny Green on a couple weeks ago. He, I don't know if he, I think he followed uh, Mulgrew into the Messengers. And Mulgrew, after the Messengers, played with Benny Carter. And Benny Green followed Mulgrew to Benny Carter. So there's a, a correlation between all of this, between all of these people and what they do when they play this remarkable music, and who they are as people as well. I think the music comes from the person, and you can't generalize and say all jazz musicians are incredible people, but a lot of them are. Playing this music affords us an experience that I think many other people don't get in other areas of functioning in life. And that is um, uh, playing this music uh, sort of compels us to be in the moment. And <clears throat> we're not always there, most of us. But wh when we, we get there, when we are in the bandstand and that something happens, when we know we have... Uh, um, performed in a way that we don't usually perform. <laughs> you know, that, that happens on occasion where we realize we weren't even there. It wasn't really about us. You know, we, we, we were uh, being a channel for creativity to express itself. And that's such a profound experience, you know, that when it happens, we're driven to try to find that experience again. And I dare say that um, that's what keeps us coming to the bandstand every night, because we're looking for that high, you know, that experience that we've experienced a few or many times somewhere along the way that uh, if we can get in that zone, so to speak, and that's, um, 
it's a rare experience experience and and um so we we're, we're slaves to to uh to that experience you know and and the search for it when i've uh had that experience it's usually been with those elder musicians that I've played with uh, because you know because their involvement in the music is so deep that um, you can more readily experience that than you can with uh, musicians of a younger generation because they're not most of them are not quite there yet you know and um, although many of the musicians I've played with over the years uh, many of them have left the planet um, I feel a certain um, I hate to say responsibility because I don't feel like I'm doing it out of responsibility but I feel like um, as old church songs I feel like I have a charge to keep you know um, guys like Woody Shaw Art Blakey, Johnny Griffin, and Tony Williams, who died for this music, uh, put an investment in me. They invested their time and their interest and their love in me. And I'm not even sure that I even deserve to be there when I look at the kind of giants they were. And, um, um, I, f I feel like that I have a charge to keep the, to carry that message on and um, that's why um, being a jazz messenger has a, that that title has a special significance to me at this time yeah. Mm. Yeah. well it, it, their investment certainly paid off you did take the charge and thankfully you were here share your creativity with us although from my perspective much much too brief <clears throat> thankfully we have this music you are part of this tradition Mulgrew Miller and I have been present when Mulgrew Miller was in the zone I've heard him with Art Blakey with Woody Shaw with Betty Carter at Bradley's and that moment that unbelievably exciting magic space that happens sometimes not all the time but sometimes in this music where everything connects the musicians are just breathing together in that perfect space perfect comfort and then the audience is wrapped up in that bubble wow hard to hard to duplicate that everybody wants to get to that not so easy though not so easy to get to it and uh, those of us who uh, are lucky enough to have been in these uh, situations seen it live you know it's something you remember all, all your life I can remember gigs that I've been to that uh, you know stays with you your entire life playing this music is a gift but not everyone can play it is jazz well can jazz be taught What's involved here is there's, there's a melodic language that we use to, to build a solo. And uh, part of that process is taking notes out of the chord structure and, and, and uh, making melody from there. You know, because the, basically the process is a melodic process of uh, improvising. And uh, so, yeah, we, we do... Um, uh, build uh, melodic lines from the structure of the chords but that that being said there's a whole by now there's a whole uh, uh, history if you will of vocabulary that's already been developed so we draw from all of that and you draw from just just you, the creative process in the moment how do you learn learn that do you learn it is it all part of you. I've always been so amazed by that. Well, it's it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot like learning to speak uh, verbally. You know, the first thing that you did when you learned to talk was you 
you talked about imitating, you know, what, what you heard your parents or your siblings say around you and you, you know, absorbed all of that and, and you started to say, very, first of all, you know, the, the most simple phrases. And then as time went on, you started to learn to have conversations, you know. Then you went to school and then you started to learn grammar, you know, syntax and all of that. Uh, um, you learn how to conceptually structure sentences and paragraphs and things like that. It's the same here. See, because I always thought with jazz pianists, it's, it's something you do. It's something, it's not so much what you learn, it's just, you, I mean, I, I, it's Oh, it's, it's definitely a learning process. It, and like I say, it's, it's much like speaking. Right. Now, you might have a, a person who's never gone to school uh -huh. and still may speak very well. And he may have learned to speak merely by imitating someone who spoke, uh, someone's who spoke uh, good grammar around him, and he may be very articulate. <laughs> Um, we have that in jazz and, uh, and players like uh, Earl Garner, who never learned to read music. Right. But he was a profound improviser, you know. But did he go to school? Did he take classes? Well, from all that I understand, he was primarily self-taught. Uh, but aren't yeah. most but, but, great jazz pianists seem to be self-taught? No, no. no not, not really. I mean, there, there's... Um, there's a certain amount of self-teaching involved, but most jazz pianists that you hear, especially these days, they've, they've uh, been, they've had some kind of training. I'm thinking more of the old timers, Marion McPart, part, 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 Hank Jones. Uh, oh no, these people were all all trained. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Marion McPartland. Um, you know, she's great at playing Bach and all those things, and so is Hank Jones. So Hank Jones can sit down and, and play a Chopin prelude. But you were all, of course, classically trained first, right? In most cases, and, but not in all cases, you know. Um, in, in, in most cases, uh, um, jazz pianists are tra classically trained first, and by the time they come to this music we call jazz, they already have a certain kind of technical and musical foundation for, for uh, you know, to build upon. Because improvising is, is, is a spontaneous process and it happens in the moment, you know. You might hear some of the same language uh, and you might even hear some of the same exact phrases but they won't be in the same place. The solo would develop differently. You see, if, if someone wants to play this music, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a thing that you dedicate much of your life to. Um, a teacher can't really teach you everything about it. Uh, he can only, basically the best that, that he can do is, is to d direct you and to point out things. But uh, you would have to listen. See, the, the, the big part of the thing is listening. You can't learn this music in a classroom. You know, it's a listening experience. So um, I, I teach at a college, and I tell, um, I tell my students, look, this can't be just a classroom experience. You know, it has to be about what you do when you leave the classroom. You know, what kind of records you listen to? What kind of live performances you hear? How much do you hear? And all of that is involved, you know, and there's only, uh, there's only so much a teacher can do for you. If he's a good teacher, he can, he can do really great things. But the, uh, what a teacher does is just makes the students aware of the essential things. You know, he has to, the student has to do all the work himself.
most standard songs have a conventional form, which, which we call AABA, which means um, every eight bars or so is a different section of the song. And the first section we call, may call A. And that section may repeat, and we call that another A, because it's like the first A. And then we have what we call the bridge, it's B section. And then um, usually you'll have a last A section, which is like the other two A sections. So basically, if you learn the fa first A section, you've learned uh, three quarters of the two, you know? And, uh, and basically what you need to learn from there is the B section. So, um, well, this song is not quite simply like that, but it's very much like that. So it's like... Similar but different. That's another A section. And then the bridge goes like this. It's a B section. Then the last section is like the first A section. So once you get used to learning songs like that, then the learning time, the time that it takes to learn the songs is, can be pretty simple, pretty fast. You are now educators, like right up there with performer, composer, <laughs> and father. How do you feel about that role and, and what do you think it's doing for the other aspects of your creativity? Well, first, let me say it's a role that I'm, I'm still surprised to find myself in, <laughs> a position that, that uh, I didn't think that I, I would be here at this point in my life, you know. I remember discussing this with Steve Nelson a couple of years ago when I first uh, got this uh, um, appointment, and I said, well, Steve, you know, um, I didn't think I would be at this point in my life, I would be doing this at this point in my life. I thought maybe later on, and he said, uh, Miller, he always calls me Miller, you know, as long as we've known each other, he's called me Miller. He said, well, Miller, you're 50 years old, it's already later on. <laughs> so, um, but I, I, I think it's essential that people who have had the opportunity to um, walk with the giants, so to speak, as I've had the opportunity to do. Uh, to, uh, it's important that we uh, continue the legacy of this music and that we share with these young people coming up, uh, we'll share with them our knowledge and our experience because there aren't many Art Blake Blakeys around. Uh, there are not enough band leaders around to, for them to play with. And so one thing that, that many of them are doing is, is going to school and studying in the colleges and universities. And I think um, uh, it's imperative that musicians such as myself and others, you know, Bobby Watson and Terrell Stafford and so many others, Antonio Hart, uh, you know, that we go into schools and talk about what we've learned from all of these people. Now, uh, you know, there's, it's always been said that jazz can't be taught, and I think that's very true. But you can, you can point the way and you can guide, you know. I always feel like, um, if I can get the students to learn how to listen, and then they can teach themselves. That's the, the main thing for me is to, to, um, um, as, a, as an educator, to give them ears, so to speak, so that they learn to listen. And if they learn to listen in the right way, they can go on and teach themselves. 
And that's what you have to do ultimately anyway, is to teach yourself. Yeah. As a parent, I'm sure you can relate to this thought that when you have children and you explain life to them, it gives you a different perspective on life. As a teacher of music, when you explain the music to your students, how does that affect your own music? Well, um, I don't know if I've talked long enough now to, to really see how that works. But I tell you one thing about young kids, uh, uh, their minds are fresh and, and uh, they're not quite habit bound yet, you know. And so uh, as an experienced performer, you might know 15 ways to do things and they may know only one. But that one way that they're doing things might be the one way you've never thought of doing it, you know. So it's interesting uh, to see their viewpoint on the same issues, so to speak, to see how they they come to the music and their perspective on improvising and all of that. Because, you know, they're, they're bright and they're intelligent and uh, they are creative. And um, I'm stimulated and inspired by, by just watching them. Now, in your present role, you are not only just an instructor or a teacher, you are running the program. As when you play, you are the leader of a group. Does that uh, leadership role in the school uh, rep uh, present you with certain challenges, certain things that you just usually don't deal with? Well, um, it presents me with um, with a role that I hadn't had before. And I, I, I would like to make sure that, first of all, that the program is um, on par with other very, very successful programs. And that uh, we're able to give the students one of the best jazz educations that they can find anywhere, hopefully. Um, the program that I'm heading now has, you know, has had by now a pretty long and healthy history. And the program was started by Thad Jones. And um, after Thad Jones, Rufus Reed, the great bassist, headed the program. and. And after him, the great James Williams headed the program. And so um, I, didn't, I didn't have a whole lot of work to do in terms of, of developing the program when I got there. The program was already highly developed. And um, uh, the staff there at the program are some of the finest musicians working in, in New York, in and around New York. And so we have a great staff of, of um, teachers there giving private lessons and so forth and so on. So um, we think that a student coming there hopefully can get uh, as good a jazz education as he can get anywhere else, you know. And um, that's what I'd like to see, that uh, we can really prepare the students to go out and, and, and be somewhat ready to, to perform, you know. Of course, the, the, the learning process goes on forever, you know. Uh, we just kind of try to give them a foundation. How many of you all who just played now can envision yourself uh, being a jazz musician as a, as a, as a profession? It's a way of li life. Not everybody did. Okay. All right, trumpet players. How many of you have heard Lee Morgan on record? Really? Yeah. Okay. Trombone players. Hi. How many of you have heard J.J. Uh, Johnson? Or Kai Wendy? <laughs> You've heard Okay. <laughs> Tenor players, how many of you have heard Hank Mobley? Okay. Alto players, how many of you have heard Sonny Stitt? Not heard of him, but have heard him on records. 
and really listen to it. Okay, the reason that, that I, I say this is because, uh, the reason I'm asking these questions, because if you're gonna really, really learn to play this music, you gotta listen to the right guys. And you gotta listen to the important people who have played this music. And um, um, that's, that's a real important part of, of your growth process, your, your progress. You gotta get the recordings and listen to these people. That's how you learn. That's how you learn to play this music. And for those, all of you who took solos just now, thank you very much. Um, but what you have to realize is that this is a language that you're playing. You have to learn the language, and the syntax of the language, just like you do in English or any other language you're learning. There's a syntax in it involved. You know, you have to learn how to put sentences and phrases together, okay? And there's a whole concept to that, you know? I mean, I, I know that you're all young right now, but let me give you just an idea about how you have to think doing this. When you start a line out, when you start playing an idea, you not only have to be mindful of where you're starting from, but you have to know at the same time where you're going. Where's that line going to end? And then, so you have point A and point B. And then you have to decide what's going to happen in between all of that. So when you start a line, you know, it, it should be logical. You're going from here, F7, in the case of the blues just now, going from F7 to B flat 7. How are you going to get to B flat 7? You got to resolve that. And there's all of this in between there. And that's what makes up the language. So that, that mm -hmm. takes a, a lot of study in a, an, analyzing on your part. Okay, the last thing I would say to you, once you figure out how to do that, start with one lick and make it your own. You know, get one idea first and learn it through the keys, learn how to phrase it and then all the right notes, make it your own. So when you play that lick, everybody <coughs> says, wow, he played that like he meant it. Or she played that like she meant it. Okay, so if you, if you keep thinking about those things, then you'll go far. For you youngsters who want to play jazz, I hope I see you on the bandstand in a few years. All right, just got caught up in that, seeing Mulgrew, watching him like that. You know, when, you, uh, when I present these clips, interview clips with him, you get a sense of Mulgrew Miller, the person. And he was a very special person. Great communicator, obviously great musician, but a uh, wonderful sense of humor. I like that bit where uh, Steve Nelson always called him Miller. You know, I, Mulgrew Miller had a name for me, Bredith. So I felt, wow, I'm special. <laughs> Mulgrew Miller is a name for me. Listening is very, very important in this music, especially when musicians play together. And when a soloist is out front, backing up a soloist, especially a pianist accompanying or comping for a soloist, is a very important role in jazz. So we're gonna listen to a few of Mulgrew's thoughts on comping and then uh, a later track from Mulgrew and John Schofield. Comping is really, really a deep subject uh, um, because there's more involved, way more involved in it than than most youngsters realize anyway, without experience. Uh, to accompany any, uh, any person, a soloist, singer, or anything, um, demands a certain kind of involvement with 
the person that you're accommodating. You know, and so you can't just just um, go on automatic pilot and do any one thing. You know, um, you're accompanying someone, and you have to make them feel comfortable, um, and uh, give them a certain kind of a support. And if you're a pianist, you have two or three different kinds of support. You know because you have rhythmic support and you have harmonic support. And you have to do all that at one time. And yet stay out of the way. You know, you can't just override and, 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 and get in the way of the solos. So you have to support them without overwhelming them. You know, and you have to be uh, um, in harmonic sympathy with them. And, then, and you have to su support, uh, you have to, uh, provide rhythmic uh, uh, support for them as well. So, um, one of the best ways to practice that is, the, especially the rhythmic and time part of it, is to, is to comp by yourself to, until you feel good, to make it feel good, because it has to feel good for the solos. And so, uh, in order to be assured that you can do it. You have to do it so that it feels good to you. You know, if you're a bass player, you have to walk the bass lines until it feels good. You know, by yourself. If you're a drummer, you play time till it feels good. You know, and then when you come into a group and everybody feels good, they're feeling good together. Okay? You know, and nobody's leaning on somebody else. You know. So I try to think of when I'm comping for a horn player or vocalist, I want to make them feel like they don't need a drummer if he, if he happens not to be there. Hmm. You know. So I might, I might at, at home, I might say, comp a blues for myself, you know. And it has to feel something, you know, it has to dance. That's the main thing. <laughs>
thanks for stopping by for an hour, checking out some old Miller. Open up the archive so you can meet the man. I'm going to close with uh, the group we opened with, Mulgrew and Buster Williams and Jimmy Cobb doing the Thad Jones composition, A Child is Born. Tomorrow, God willing, Christian Sands will be my guest. He was supposed to be here Monday. Mercury in retrograde, things get weird, he wasn't here, but I had to talk to him. And uh, hopefully tomorrow he'll be here. But who knows? Anything is possible in this life. Uh, we were supposed to have another guest today. He ghosted on me. He shall go nameless. God bless him. <laughs> Instead, I got to do this show, which is fine. I just go in with the punches, you know? I just roll with it. I just keep going. I, that's my secret in life. I only know how to do one thing. Keep going. So, Christian Sands on Thursday, tomorrow. Next Monday, an outspoken man, musically and with his blogs, his articles, Mr. Nicholas Payton will be here. Wonderful trumpeter from New Orleans. His music has gone in a couple different directions in his life. Kind of an outspoken guy. Doing a lot of live streaming here. Really looking forward to uh, getting his thoughts on that. He also uh, makes uh, contributions prominent in his live streaming. Be interested to see uh, how that's working for him. Next Wednesday, uh, the focus will be on jazz films, not the performance and educational stuff we do here, but jazz in the movies, fictional films, uh, most of which has sucked. We'll talk about that with Steve Protier. And uh, next Friday, the subject is racism. Is there racism in jazz? Well, it seems to be racism every place else. Why should jazz be any exception? Certainly, in my world, in my musical world, it's not about who you are, what you look like, where you came from. You can either play or you can't. It's as simple as that. But uh, this is a complex uh, life that we have here. And uh, certainly uh, one place where there has been some racism uh, over the years has been uh, in the LA studios. My guest next Friday will be Winston Bird, a trumpeter who was on the show a couple of weeks ago. Very talented, uh, funny guy. And uh, he's gonna talk about some of his experiences with uh, racism, and uh, maybe we'll have other people on as well. But certainly, uh, it does exist. I mean, uh, jazz is not an island unto itself. It's part of the society, and uh, you cannot uh, think for one second that uh, the ale, the things that bother society are not uh, bother jazz as well. Although I don't think there's many Trump supporters who are jazz musicians. Uh, do white artists get more support? You know, we can talk about that. I'll tell you one thing, uh, an example of uh, racism in jazz that I experienced. Uh, when I was uh, writing for Downbeat in the 70s, in the late 70s, I was the New York editor of Downbeat magazine and wrote a lot of articles, and that was a great time. But I noticed that... Uh, at that point, there were very few downbeat covers of black musicians. And I, I it did not kind of compute with me. I couldn't figure it out. I was just starting out. I didn't want to rock the boat, so to speak. But uh, at some point, I met someone who knew the situation in downbeat. And... Uh, I don't want to say Don at that time was owned by a racist millionaire who hates jazz. You could put that spin on it, but the guy who owned Don at the time, I think his name was Jack Marr, he was very interested in palling around with Buddy Rich and Mel Torme and Woody Herman, and he didn't see many black musicians on the cover of Don That's changed, that has changed. I, I, you can't say uh, Downbeat is a racist magazine because it's not. 
I mean, I've been reading Tao Bing since I was a kid. I haven't read it lately, but uh, well, we'll explore this topic of racism. Uh, I'd love to know your thoughts on it as well. I mean, uh, this is the world that we live in. Uh, a lot of negative stuff. But we have something beautiful, something positive, And that has been today the music of Mulgrew Miller and Mulgrew Miller the man. And I want to thank you for joining me and come back tomorrow. We'll see what else, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow.
That's it. That's the end of the show, folks. Welcome to the after show. This is what happens after the show is over. I don't know what I'm going to talk about today, but I tell you one thing. I get hungry after these shows. I usually have breakfast. I have several breakfasts, but uh, noon to one I do the show and then it's like, what am I going to eat? Now I spent most of my life in New York City and when, you, when that's the question, there are many answers. Usually it's just walk out the door, you have your choice of 15 different places. Or you can have delivered, whatever. I live in Tucson, Arizona, the Sonoran Desert. It's 102 degrees here. Uh, the choices are much more limited. Uh, but, well... And I don't want, after I do a show, I don't feel like cooking anything. I want to eat something immediately. Uh, Chinese food is a possibility. It's about a mile and a half away. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a, a Tucson Chinese food is not, once again, spoiled again by New York City culture. You can't get world-class Chinese food in Tucson, Arizona. I'm sorry. It's reality. What you can get here is world-class Mexican food. Fantastic Mexican food, but I got to be in the mood for Mexican. Some people can eat it, eat it every day. I can't. Moderation for me. But uh, Pringles, I try to avoid shit. I don't want to put shit in my body. I'm 70 years old. I really want to take care of myself so I can be here for a while. Because uh, I'm in some ways, this is the best part of my life. But... Uh, I can melt cheese on my bread. I've done that. <laughs> yes, I've been in the melted cheese bread department many times. So let's say, could I go for Chinese food? What I would love is sushi. Well, out of the picture completely. You can't get fresh sushi in the middle. Sushi, say it. You can't get fresh sushi in the middle of the desert. Impossible, right? Uh, boil a potato. Neil says, no, I'm not going to boil a potato. <laughs> then what have I got, a boiled potato? No, that's, I, it's, it's got to be more than that. Now, I could go McDonald's, Arby's, fried chicken. Uh, oh, God, you know, pa uh, what's that place? Panda, fried panda, that pseudo Chinese restaurant. Oh, it's so bad. Actually, you know what? There's a chicken wing place. I forgot about that place. That's what I'll do. I'll get some wings. They're passable. Not fantastic, but they're passable. So that problem is solved. Yeah. Yeah. I am going to sign off here now that I have all the problems of the world solved. Uh, at least my world. Panda Express. Yeah, that place totally sucks. Ugh! I generally, I don't eat fast food. And the, the pseudo, you got to watch out for those places. Uh, do you have mango in Tucson? Says KB, DJ KB from Ghana. Mango, mango, yes. Yeah, we get a lot of imported uh, fruits and vegetables from Mexico. Uh, a lot of really good stuff. A lot of fresh vegetables here from Mexico and flown in from South America as well. So uh, we get some nice mango here. Uh, and I forgot what I was going to say, but if it's important enough, it'll come back. It was probably about food because uh, this is the time of day when I think about eating food. So I hope you are enjoying your day, eating well, and uh, I'll be back tomorrow. I hope. I don't know what's going to happen. Flying saucers might land. I mean, oh, here's a, here's a question for you to ponder as I depart today. What if you were driving, if you were driving down uh, a deserted road in the middle of nowhere and a flying saucer lands and ooh, the steps come down, a lighted portal opens up beckoning you? 
would you go up the steps and into that flying saucer? Or would you get in your car and get the hell out of there as quickly as possible?